So um, in today's session, I will probably aim at covering uh, a qualitative uh, method that we use in behavioral finance. Um, it is a paper that we've designed, a technique that we've designed over the years. And I must admit that um, with this technique, um, we've, we've done some publications, obviously. Um, it's, it's not just a publication for this one. Um, it's, uh, we've got the Best Paper Award in London um, with this technique in behavioral finance in a specialized uh, behavioral finance uh, conference. Uh, you, if you were at the conference, it was a cutthroat conference, like everybody was doing the best, all the best people were out there, and one of the people that presented, um, he was measuring uh, the test, uh, your, your sweat in your hands, and then he got a donation from an investment bank, about $1 million of equipment, and he used this equipment to measure the sweat on your hand and then see how you make investment decisions. So when he presented, uh, it was clear to everybody that he is a winner for being able to produce a research like this. So at um, conference dinner, as I'm sitting, putting my head down, it's about time to, to, to announce and the best winner of the paper, etc. And for me, it was a no-brainer. He's going to get it. Um, it was a very specialized uh, conference whereby everybody got to see everybody's paper. Like, uh, if I present, everybody else gets to see it. And when they're presenting, uh, I get to see it too. So everybody knows everybody's work. And it was very clear to each other who's going to win it, at least in my mind. And then they said, uh, we want it. And um, I uh, couldn't believe my luck. And uh, as any uh, athlete will do after you, you accept uh, the award, I went back to him in front of everybody. I said, I am so sorry, but I, I think you, you deserve to get it. And um, he stand up in front of everybody. He says, Vic, um, I'll tell you what I didn't say in my conference was there are loopholes in everything, and it's not a fine tune. At this point in time, it is a concept, but we're not there yet. There's no message we're sending. We were just telling you guys what we were up to. And the people who read the paper, and we probably read yours, we probably understood um, all the loopholes in it. And that's why you want it fair and square. So I was quite happy with this paper and what we've done. And I'd like to share it with you today. And this has brought me some fame personally because I was still a young guy at the time um, when we got the award. Um, the editor of Qualitative Research for Financial Markets said to me, a guy like you doing qualitative research, and mind you, qualitative research in finance hardly existed at the time. Because all of us in finance thought you have to have a mathematical equation to get it published. And despite I knew it, um, I also decided to change uh, my approach because there is information that we can get from quantitative research, which are way powerful than what an equation will tell us. For a simple reason, we are human beings. An equation will never be able to represent us. So it was a notion that I had in mind, and if you read my last book on behavioral finance, you'll see I made that out loud, very out clear. Mathematics, yes, but there's also another side of us, which is being a human being. So we, we, with that in mind, they put me on the board um, of qualitative uh, research in financial markets. Up until now, I still review for this journal. Um, as a proud member, they always send me something. Uh, I even helped the journal to get a ranking in Australia because I believe in the work that they do. And I got invited to submit to uh, European Journal of Finance on a special issue. And if you look at it, it's still a 
well, it was mentioned, this paper was mentioned as one of the best cited in the, I think, 13 or 14 best cited papers in European Journal of Finance. So I think it, it makes it um, to today's session in terms of um, the impact it has had on, in our field. So allow me to share um, uh, this paper with you. Now, unlike yesterday when I said, well, we will take, say, news arrival and look where things are going, this time we are going to listen to our practitioners. I was in Melbourne and um, there was a, um, a board meeting and a, uh, a round table and the Finance Treasury Association of Australia uh, told us that they have a problem. And the problem was people don't know what working capital management is. And we are talking about corporate treasurers or CFO, depending on which country you come from. Uh, what they do is the same thing, which is managing all the money of an organization. They are the most trusted people in the organization. And these guys in Australia earns about $1 million a year in terms of salary. So they're clearly uh, very highly paid individuals. Uh, and they had a problem. And the problem was board of directors and um, the CEOs never paid attention to them. They go and make decisions. And after they make the decisions, they go back to their corporate treasurers and say, hey, I need 400 mil. I need it by yesterday. Uh, can you get it to me? And these guys are like, what? Now you tell me. When did you know about this? Two months ago when we started discussing. So why didn't you tell me before? Could have told you we don't have 400. We can get 350. And I could have played, uh, and I could have tried to find more, and I would have liquidated a few things and make sure we get the 400. So this is a problem that, um, that they were facing. Like People were not including them in the decision-making process. And that had a bigger uh, problem, a bigger problem that you and I can think about. It goes down to the problem that exists between finance people and accounting people. And if you listen to your finance professors, they will tell you not to trust your accountant. And vice versa. And if you're a finance guy, you see your accountant coming and you go, oh my God, it's compliance, run away. You don't want to touch them. And we know that they lie to us and they think that we are rogue people. So there is this behavioral and cultural difference that floats in. And that's why we, we, we don't well, we don't do very well with accountants and vice versa. So this is what they ask us, how do we fix this problem? So they, they told us that Within in, in the organization, they are trying to explain this to the CEOs, but they don't think they can fix the problem. That's why we came to academia and say, Vic, I need you to bring working capital management as a sexy thing in your curriculum. I need you to publish it. I need you to let the world know that this exists. And if you start teaching students about working capital management, in your classroom and tell them how to um, relate to us and understand we're all different, but then we still have a job to do. How do we work together? And that was the basis of this paper. Um, so that was the, the problem that we were fixing in our community. And as you can see, it's beyond um, a paper. And whoever reads a paper will understand these guys are trying to do something else. And that said, how do we do it? Uh, how do I prove, mathematically speaking, um, that this is an issue? How do I bring that these guys are trying a number of things? And, and I couldn't find any other technique but quality research. And that's what I want to share with you <clears throat> today. I will not discuss the financial section of this paper because it will take me maybe two hours just to go through it. I'm assuming that all of you, you've done some um, finance and you understand working capital management. 
and then I'm going to push forward on the technique rather than uh, the content. Now, um, one thing that was emerging was that is serious in um, in uh, in the world of finance. We were having organisations whereby with corporate governance, it's clear in the banking industry that you need to have a, a risk management committee and somebody accountable for this. But in other industries, it's not mandatory to have risk management. So the question that comes into mind for an organization is, do you have risk management? And yes, it is important to have, they understand it. Now, who's going to do it? Do I build up a team? Do I hire one person? One person means cost, high cost, we don't want that. So who's going to do it? They thought, maybe accountants can do it. And I'll give you an example where this just backfired. They, they had a risk management team for an airline company. And the guy got an offer somewhere else. And while managing the risk of oil prices, this guy was taking positions of, like say, 60 days futures contract, etc. And he, he asked for about $2,000 worth of increment in his salary per month so he could stay. But they said, no, you don't bargain with us, off you go. And we will have our accountant to take care of it. The accountant came in, never understood finance. Um, he, he looked at it and go, oh, this guy is uh, hedging maybe every 60 days and he's wasting time. He's making himself a useful to the company by just doing it, making sure that other people need him. So what the accountant did, the accountant was um, uh, bought futures contract for three years, so that three to five years, so he wouldn't have to do the job again. And guess what? He locked the price of uh, fuel, uh, of oil, at 154 or 155 contract, a barrel. A few months later, oil prices dropped to about 55. The airline company was stuck with an absolutely large bill in terms of buying fuel uh, prices. The airline was nearly broke because it was a national airline. The government intervened and um, and bailed out the um, bailed out the airline, and the accountant was sacked. And all it was a two thousand dollars salary increment for one person to manage his risk. So from then, I think it was clear that accountants cannot do it. Yet we find a number of companies that still struggle to understand, well, who does it, accountant or finance manager? And we are trying to um, answer this question and tackle this problem at the same time in this paper. So we ask a question whether risk management is the fifth arm of um, uh, of working capital management. Now, you probably um, uh, you probably uh, don't know that when you write a paper, you also need to know who would be interested in reading your paper. Who are the target audience that would think it's necessary for this paper to be published? In this case, clearly, the FTA made it clear that. Uh, working capital managers or corporate treasurers will have to do it. But what you also don't know is when it comes down to ROE, uh, which is uh, what um, shareholders are looking for, if you improve your efficiency in any one of those, it results in a higher ROA. So if your ROA increase, then shareholders will be happy. So any kind of working capital management would be quite good for, um, um, for the business. Then. You know, when um, you go and borrow money for your house, you borrow for one meal to buy a property, and a bank would need maybe 300 more clients like you to be profitable. But when they deal with a working capital manager, this person will take one loan, uh, 300, um, 300, 300 million. So that is 300, contra uh, 300 customers in one go. So if you look at any bank, they have a corporate division. And the corporate division is always to wine and dine with the working capital managers so that the working capital managers are on their speed dial and when they need money, they just call them. 
So clearly, loan providers really need to have, um, they, they love working capital management because this is what they look at before they decide to give a loan or not. And then the last one that nobody wants to hear about is um, legal advisors. So if you were to be sued for not paying your money or your debt, you need to be legally pronounced dead or bankrupt. And legal advisors also need this. So you see, just by starting an introduction of looking at who needs this, um, this sort of work, you can see why it, it, it has potential to give you a good citation. It's got a potential to give you a, a, even an award. Now we just need to do it properly. So when I started with this, um, when I started with, uh, with, with, with this project, of course, I put uh, my PhD student, um, Yilang Zhao, on it. Because, as you know, I would not have time. And when you become a, a, a lecturer, when you start your career, you finish your PhD, you just don't have time for research. Uh, you only focus on your teaching, and then you set some, si some time on the side for research. So I knew that from the start, and then I started working with PhD students, because they have a time which I don't have. And that's how we complement each other. So, uh, I, and like anybody else, like a good academic, when it's time to start any project, the first thing that you do is rush to the literature review. So we did. And what we were reading at the time was uh, an eye-opener. These guys were having debates around how many components of working capital management do we need? Is it cash? Is it accounts receivable? Is it inventory? Is it debt? Uh, is it just cash and debt? And these these papers were really, really good to us. Like we thought, oh my God, we're learning something. There's a debate. It's great. We have a debate in the literature. We can go and contribute. Little that I know, this is so unreal. Because I took my literature review, prepared my questionnaire, and I went to see and do my did my first interview with one working capital manager. And he was he was laughing, laughing at me. And I said, what's so funny? And he says, is that what you guys teach? This is so unreal. Like, it doesn't sound anything like what we do. We don't even have a debate. There is no debate. So I said, please explain to me. So he said, look, if you look at it, uh, if you are a bank, you don't have inventory. So then why would inventory be five? Why do I have to have an inventory division um, in, in, in my working capital management portfolio? Fair enough. Um, big, big corporations, they only deal with big clients. So then why would we have a cash management when we do netting? Fair enough. So you see, these things, you don't get it. You don't get it in the literature. You need to go down and speak to the men on the ground. And these were our guys. And they told us so much that I couldn't believe my own luck with the amount of information. So it took us nine months to do the literature review, prepare the questionnaire, go out there, and sitting down with this man, which was supposed to be a lunch for 45 minutes, and he's quite a busy man, Remember, he earns like one million dollars uh, a, a, a year. He doesn't have time for academics or people. Sorry. So the man sits down and he ends up spending four hours with us. Why? Because he feels so sorry for academics. And this is what we're teaching our kids. They feel bad. And he opened up and gave us so much. It took us three months to redesign our questionnaire, everything. And then our whole strategy of how you do research and qualitative research changed. And I'll explain that to you uh, when we get to the methodology section, how did it change? Before now, what we learned from them was information that they give us uh, while talking to him. He says, well, I told you, like, we're trying to tell people uh, working capital management is important and you need to listen to us. So this is the same thing that I told you at the start. They emphasize the importance. They're doing it 
on the ground. And we now have to do this on, uh, uh, in our classroom. And at the time, uh, there was board of directors who wanted them to take care of governance. So they were putting in place a structure and governance, etc. And back then, people did not know what sort of KPIs uh, you need to have. So they were designing these performance uh, measures and drivers, setting goals, and try to do change management. And um, all this was coming. And guess what? Of all these factors, of all these factors that he mentioned that what they're doing, the only thing we got from the literature was outperforming, outperforming industry average. So we were so bad in understanding the practice, but then we learned so much from the practice that everything started to change. And if I was a mathematical professor, I would not never, I am a mathematical professor, but I don't do mathematics, I do financial mathematics, of course. But if I was to wear my stubborn mathematical hat for doing a paper, I would have missed out on a number of things like this. And clearly, they came up with a number of matrices that they used. They came around and told us about a number of products being used, like um, rollover agreements. And they explain how important it is uh, uh, in terms of financing. And if you haven't heard about it, and I'll probably talk, tell you the story, and you'll see how interesting it is. And these interesting stories, uh, when you read it in a paper, you will say, OK, wow, this is unbelievable. Um, so the story goes like this. Um, before the GFC, people use a pecking order theory to look at what sort of financing methods they will use. So in terms of debt financing, they pick the, the, the instrument that is the cheapest. And usually the cheapest would be short-term instruments like 60 days, 90 days, bank bills, that sort of thing. So what they do, if you want to buy a building uh, and you want it to be at low cost of borrowing, you would probably use a, um, a, a short-term instrument like a 90-day bank bill. So the way it works is you borrow 90 days. After 90 days, you go and ring your bank and you borrow for another 90 days. And then you tell them, OK, the money that I've borrowed, paid for uh, the one that I owe you, what is the interest rate differential for this, free, uh, for this quarter? And I pay you that. So this used to be like a routine thing for, um, for finance managers to do. Ring the bank. Matt, how are you, man? Good. I'm rolling over. Yep. What's the interest rate? Done. See you in three, in three months. So this used to be a, a standard procedure. But then come down to uh, GFC period, the lesson that we've learned was about um, credit, um, credit, uh, uh, credit risk. So you call Matt, Matt goes, they can't help you today. Why not? Well, you need to send me all your paperwork. What do you need? Your term sheet, of course. And I'll talk about term sheet, what it is in a minute. So, OK, I'll send it to you right away. So you send your term sheet. A term sheet is a document that shows your assets, liabilities, your financial status, and if you don't meet the minimum requirement, you're not going to get your funding. And guess what? During the crisis, a number of his firms didn't meet uh, the credit level, the credit risk, uh, they didn't pass it. So you get a phone call. Sorry, they can't help you this time. You have to pay. What do you mean I have to pay? Oh, you have to pay for your debt. OK. So you hang up the phone. You call the next bank. Hey, do you want my business? Here's the amount. No problem. I want your business. Send me your term sheet. No deal. And you call anyone around the time, there's no deal. What does that mean for a business? Bankruptcy. So you, the bank will file against you, and the judge will automatically say, yep, he's got asset, sell asset, pay liabilities, simple as this. This is how many banks just went downhill uh, with all of the agreements. And now we have a study picking up on this, trying to tell the story. It's quite, uh, it's quite significant. And have you read about rollover agreements in any of the literature review? Have you uh, come across it in your textbook? Nobody talks about it in the way that it's being done. And that's why I say it's, it's, it's really, really yeah, cool in terms of what you get by 
interviews, interviewing, he hearing the stories. Um, um, but the moral of a story here is the following. Would you take 100 credit cards to buy a house? No. And we all know why. You can't support it. Next question is, would you take a mortgage to buy your milk? No. So this is a matching concept, isn't it? Um, when you have a long-term debt, if, uh, if you are purchasing uh, a building, it's a long-term investment, so you need long-term instruments. And if you are looking for short-term needs, you do short-term instruments. This was one thing that was being violated by these people, and we wanted to capture some of those. So as we go, we find more and more information about the cash management. Um, I can go on, and it, it, because it's not a finance lecture, it's more about the research. I, can, I do have a lot of stories around each and every one, but I'm not going to tell you because it's going to go over and over. I want to cover a lot more about the research component of this. But it's quite fascinating, the cash, the inventory, uh, the accounts receivable, and as you can see, if I go back, uh, all the red parts, all the red parts are things that were not documented properly in our literature. Okay. So all these were new gigs that we were uncovering uh, using um, our our. Now I, I, I want to I want to talk about say um, the debt because debt is something that we all uh, teach in corporate finance. Everybody here knows about Modi, Gliani, and Miller, and you know about uh, Myers and Majluf, about the picking order theory, etc. So what did we bring um, into the equation? Clearly, we're talking about rollover term sheets, but there's a couple of things um, that people don't know. The first one is um, core debt level. So if you look at a business who's selling uh, in, in, in Australia or wherever it is, um, so if you are to uh, prepare yourself for Christmas sales in Australia, you probably have to order your goods from China somewhere around June, July. And that means you need to make a payment in June, July. And um, then when you receive the goods, you make the next payment, etc. And if you look at your cash flow, your cash flow is in the red in the months running from July, August, September. But once you get your product, you start selling it in, say, October, November. And that's when your red starts to change to orange and then green, which means that your cash flow would be quite high up uh, in, um, in December and January and throughout the year up until you place the next order. So then why do you need a debt level, uh, your debt to be a large number when you don't need it? So then um, Australians have designed a called up level that fluctuates with whatever you need it. And that is a new gig that, um, it's not new, but it's, it's seasonal debt. And it's something that we don't see when people talk about debt in our literature. There is something else which is called negative gearing. And negative gearing is um, particularly unique uh, in the Austrian context. And every time I explain this to people, they said, I wish our government was as generous as it is in Australia. And let me explain that. So let's say you have an investment. Let's say I, um, I, 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 I buy a house as an investment property in Australia. So my mortgage would be 5,000. And then my repayments would be, uh, sorry, my, uh, my rental income would be 4,000. So every month I'm down by about thousand dollars short of cash at the end of the year i'll be short of cash by twelve thousand now because i i pay income tax and quite high rate after i do my tax return i'm going to get twelve thousand back again okay. so then next year if i use my cash flow i am not short ever again so it's only in the first year that you you get that so this negative gearing allows people to buy even companies. So if you make a lot of money instead of paying corporation tax, you buy companies that are making losses and you, you, you absorb them and you claim them back. And, and that's what this is uh, 
this is not in the international literature because not many countries offer this, uh, this, this sort of thing. And then in terms of um, uh, risk, there was a lot, operational risk, market risk, et cetera. Now, the next thing, um, as you know, I studied my PhD in the area of uh, behavioral finance. And um, in behavioral finance, I've read enough and I wanted to make a, a difference. And somehow, even yesterday, if you look at my papers, uh, it's got like narcissism. There's always a touch of, of my PhD in almost everywhere. And that just sort of uh, give it a, a different touch from other people. That's how we make it look different from other papers. So what we did next was um, to look at the behavior of people. And the idea is very simple. We're calling it profiling. We're going to profile a working capital manager. So if I may ask you to think for a minute, how does a drug addict look like? Just whatever comes into your mind. Just give me a minute. Just think about it. So now that you have this in your mind, you've already profiled what a drug addict looks like. My next question is profile a working capital a working capital manager. What do they look like? Okay. So I if you have never been exposed to one, you probably would not know. Me living and working with them and seeing them on a regular basis, I know what they look like. So this job is mostly it's male dominated. 80 to 90 percent of them will be male so i can see like a male walking in front of me and this job because it pays so much you are on the call maybe 24 hours a day so if your boss needs something needs money they call you if there's anything that goes wrong they call you so you're on call for x number of hours and guess what if you're not sharp enough none of your employees get paid and you will not believe me the task that they do sometimes just to make sure you get your salary they run around like crazy to ensure certain things goes okay so these guys they sort of never have time for themselves so let's think about it if you are sitting on your desk 24 hours and sleeping in bed and still working um you don't have time for exercise what will happen to your body? As you can see, they will have, in Australia, because they drink beer, we say they will have a beer gut. So you can think about that. And because they use their head so much, and it's like really pulling the hair out of their head, literally their head just drops. So they are usually bald, and they are not young, because for you to get a job like this, you, you need to, um, to have won the trust of the owner. So usually you start as a, an accounting graduate, uh, you understand the accounting uh, or sometimes finance uh, and accounting together and you, you start as a junior auditor somewhere and you move your way up and they pick you up to do the accounting and they trust you and then over the years if you've helped them uh, when they were uh, in trouble with money and you managed to resolve their financial problems, they say, okay, you're my guy, I keep you. And that's how you get the money. It's not by having a PhD. It's not by publishing a paper. It's about winning the trust of the owner. Think of it this way. In your household, who would you trust with your money? Well, for me, I trust my wife and my daughter. Yeah. And you, whoever you are, you trust your next family. So when it comes to a business, it's the same thing. They will only find somebody that they trust to give it to. Okay. So now... I am profiling a, a, a working capital manager. So then when, if imagine I, I, I now I'm on, on, on the interview panel to recruit a, um, uh, a finance manager for my, for my work. If a guy comes in and he's slim, I'm thinking, why is he slim? So he has time to run. And that means uh, the owners will never have access to him because he wants to do his own thing. For me, it's, uh, okay, let him go. He's not going to fit. So, again, if a female comes in and I go, this job, no way. She's not going to last very long. 
uh, it's too intense. Let her go. So you see how we use um, we we use some profiling already in recruitment, but then I wanted to go a bit deeper than this. I wanted to look at behavioral biases that is not so much that you can see. And the idea behind behavioral finance is the following: we use psychology and put it to our to our advantage. And the concept is very simple. If you look at a cat. A cat doesn't like to eat medicine. Try to feed your cat some medicine, impossible. But then if we use the psychology of a cat, it's a totally different story. So how do we use the psychology of a cat? Well, we sort of know cat don't like um, to have things on their fur. If you put anything, they like to clean themselves up. So if you use your medication in terms of a paste and you just put it in their coat, they're just going to uh, lick it until uh, they eat all the medication. So that is easy, isn't it? So that's the basis of psychology. Why can't we do something that will, um, will be natural? And even in the recruitment of a, um, of a uh, working capital manager. But then we don't know what are these characteristics, and that's what we want to, to find out. Now, to give you a glimpse before we, we move on, 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 on those biases, I, I, I I'll say, I, I'll ask you to think about a friend. Do you have a friend that when you go out for dinner or drinks with him or her, when you order food and you order a jug of Coke and they only drink one glass of Coke and they see you drinking two glasses and when the bill comes, they say, hey, uh, we, it's an equal split, it's $10 each, but then I only drank one glass of uh, Coke, so maybe I should give you nine fifty and not 10 and you pay ten fifty. Do you have a friend like this? Just think about a friend. Now, you may be thinking that this friend is deranged, it's not right, but this is what we call a behavioral bias. Now, in behavioral finance, we say, how can we use this person to our advantage? Because behavioral biases is not necessarily bad. So let's say for a minute, I have a business that is selling on credit. Now, I'm selling on credit and I have trouble because people are not paying me. What if I was to hire your stingy friend for this job? Well, it will be well, are you paying me for this? He's going to say, seriously, are you paying me to do my job? I love doing this. I'll extract money from these people just like that. And they will be so creative. They'll be so good at it. So that's what we're trying to do. And now, where do we start? Again, we go back to the literature. Literature tells us that finance people has got four main biases. The first one is uh, representativeness bias. And this is where uh, we look at something as a pattern. And let, let, me, let me ask you, uh, I'll ask you a question. I know you can't answer, but think about it in your head. And let's see. So I'm going to start tossing a coin just right here, right now. I toss it once, I get a tail. I toss it twice, I get a tail. I toss it a third time, I get a tail. I toss it a fourth time, I get a tail. I toss it a fifth time, I get a tail. So if I toss it the sixth time, what would that be? What will I get? So a number of you are thinking tail, right? Because you've seen a pattern. Now what you've done wrong is you've looked at the pattern, but you fail to look at the probability. What's the probability of having a head and tail? 50%. So when people fail to look at our probability distribution and look at patterns and make decisions, we have a problem. It's called representativeness bias. And a number of us, when we chart to make investment decisions, we look at this up and down. Don't get me wrong, including me. Uh, sometimes when I'm under serious stress, I'm gonna show me, show me the graph, boom, 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 make decisions very quickly, okay? So, it happens, and you don't have time to calculate the probabilities as well. 
So that's called um, uh, representativeness bias. The next one is um, overconfidence. So we, we train our students to be confident. Why? Because if I have a student who goes in and try to pitch a product and say, I've got this investment opportunity, it's amazing. Uh, I'd like you to sign up for it. And the guy asks, um, are you sure about this? No, oh, sir, I'm not too sure. Well, if you're not too sure you're selling, why would the other guy believe you and, and they'll smell your um, insecurity and they're not going to buy it? So people know this in finance and we train them and go, no, sir, this is the best thing that will happen to you. So we talk with confidence. You see, what, what is happening behind the scene is we are trying to project what is going to happen to this investment. The projection for forecasting on the performance of this investment, which is under the spotlight right now. So the forecasting bit, whenever it is difficult, your confidence is kicking. But as it becomes way more difficult, you bypass the level of confidence and you step into overconfidence. And a lot of people, look, it's simple. I tell you I'm not confident. You don't sign the deal. I go back to my work. My boss sucked me. I tell you with all the confidence, that's the best deal you'll ever see in your life. Sign the deal. You go back to your boss. Everybody's happy. So our, our business leads us to overconfidence. And with that overconfidence, and if you happen to get it right this time, you think you have a master of universe. Yeah? But if you get it wrong, well, you get sacked sometimes, and that's how it is. So people, when they are put into position to predict, they truly become overconfident. So we know that we have this in our culture in finance. So I want to test for it. The next thing is um, a loss aversion bias. Loss aversion bias is, let's say I take you to the casino and I say, let's, let's do some gambling. Here's your $100. Like $100. We all have our starting money, 100 And let's say we win it. So we, we put $100, we got $100. I say, take your money out. So you've taken your capital out. You have now $100. Now I tell you, this is money that you just earn. Let's, let's take some gamble. And you place a bet, you earn $10. And I tell you, hey, I'm doing a survey now. Um, hey, uh, out of 10, how happy are you on this $10 win? You'll say, ah, oh, 7 out of 10. You're happy, but 7 out of 10. And then you keep gambling, and you're still on the rise. It's not even your money. And you lose 10 bucks. I said, stop, pose. How angry are you right now with losing 10 bucks? You are likely to say 9 out of 10. And when you say 9 out of 10, this is when we know you have loss aversion bias, meaning the pain of the losses is way more than the, uh, the, the happiness that you get from uh, the game. That is known as, as loss aversion bias. Again, this is a, a bias that is inbuilt in our uh, people uh, that works in the finance industry. So the next thing is um, um, self-serving bias. And self-serving bias is, you know, uh, I just made a, 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 a deal uh, on property here, and I actually made 1.6 mil uh, dirhams on the deal. And what I'm telling you now, well, it's because of uh, um, I'm a finance professor, always did charting. I did all these things and I understand the psychology of the market. I've got this contrarian behavior. I've got this and that. Look, it's all very thanks to Vic. Yeah? And then let's say in my next deal, I lose some money. And mind you, I am on the next deal because I bought another property trying to do the same thing. If I lose money in the next three months, what would I say? It's COVID-19. See, 
I didn't see that. I'm so sorry. I thought COVID-19 would have been better, but it has to be COVID-19. So what I'm doing is everything that happens, if it is good, it's me, me, and me. I've done it. But if it is bad, it's not me. It's an external factor. That is known as self-serving bias. In fact, 70% of people have these biases. So be prepared when you have a somebody like this uh, who's got this bias. You will never win because every time you tell them your performance is bad, they say, no, that's not because of me, because of that. And you know how irritating it is when you tell somebody you're wrong and they tell you, no, they're not. And that, that, so that's the sort of guy that you can see self-serving bias coming up. So now that we, we understand these and we've narrowed it down, I'm going to design, of course, a questionnaire to capture this. So it's a survey methodology, and, and I have to capture it through, through this. So now, what are we trying to prove or show? We can't prove. It's not mathematics. So I'm going to say, if you have lost aversion bias, what is it that you do good or wrong in cash management? What is it that you do with uh, inventory management, accounts receivable, debt management, and risk management? So that's a novelty uh, that we were trying to do. The next thing on is, okay, we need to understand that there is behavioral characteristics and there's also um, uh, the, the characteristics of a firm, which is fundamentals. Yeah. So if you work for a firm, the size, the performance, the gender, all these characteristics are things that um, we need to look into. So, of course, in my survey methodology, I'm going to control for that. So, clearly, the methodology is as follows. Okay, and this is a, um, the bit where you would like to learn more, right? If you look at people, they either do, like, when they say qualitative, they only do, say, interviews, and then they publish about the interviews. And then they move on, they do questionnaires, and they publish about questionnaires. I did it in a pragmatic way. I got so much information. And as you, you remember, I was telling you all the red bits of uh, new information. I got all this. And I could have published a paper just on interviews. But I knew one thing. The finance journals were not ready for it. I was up to a straight rejection. And I reinvested um, this knowledge and I reinvested it by building a questionnaire. And the questionnaire is what we designed. And the questionnaire was brilliant, but it was quite long. We had to chop it down, etc. And you know, the question is how many people do we interview before we can stop interviewing and getting the information? So what I found was the first guy, he sat for four hours. We had so much information. We went back three months. We redesigned everything. The second person was probably three hours, and we had a lot of information. By the time we reached seven people that we've interviewed, we interviewed uh, the eighth one, there is no value added. And there's nothing new that we could find. Everything that they're telling me is like, okay, been there, done that, know that, there's no new things. And mind you, each and every one of these interviews cost me maybe uh, $300 because, of course, it was paid by, by university. So these guys, they don't have time. Um, they will not hang out with you. So if you invite them for lunch on a Friday afternoon uh, or whatever time they, they feel, then you, you get them to a beautiful lunch and you serve them your, their drinks, whatever they want to drink. So they sit down, it's like a conversation, and they say to you, you know, I'm glad I'm spending this time with you. And I said, why is that? Um, work is so tough. Yeah, you make it easy, like, you know, it's good to give back to the community and to our kids, and yeah, uh, it's good. So they don't come because of money, they get money. But they come because of the status we're giving them. It's good. 
Now, having said that, remember, I, I, I am a relatively new in finance and qualitative back then, but I've learned so much. I have rejected paper two weeks ago or last week in a journal uh, that accept qualitative papers in finance. And I think these guys claim they did interviews of 22 people. And I said to them, 22 people, what information are you getting after seven? And at the same time, I've been on examiner's panel where students will come and say, we did nine interviews. We're not sure if that is enough, whether we need to do more. And so we're just students. So please help us out. Uh, I think we need to do more 30 to reach a normal distribution. I said to them, you've done the right thing. You were smart. You just didn't get it. Uh, watch it. There's no new information. Why would you continue? It's a waste of time and energy. And then you've got people who think that I can interview some people, write it and publish. It doesn't work this way. It has to be thorough and you're not going to fool other people because we've done it somewhere. So they send it to somebody who's published and they, they know who we are and who are the people. And then when I see something unusual and I go question mark, question mark means rejection. The next thing that you need to know, um, it's about research in, in this kind of research. Um, have you heard stories on how, uh, say, uh, people disappeared and were kidnapped by aliens in the 1930s, 40s, etc. Well, to tell you the truth, they were kidnapped, not by uh, aliens, but by scientists. And scientists will take them and then do all sorts of experiments on these people. So, guess what? We talk about demographic factors. So, if I needed um, uh, a male, 50, bold, etc. So I will ask somebody to kidnap that person and bring it to my lab, and I'll do all my testing. Clearly, this is an acceptable behavior. You would agree with me, right? Well, we stopped doing that in the 1950s. And in the 1970s, um, we now ask for uh, ethics approval. So it is our way to do business in such a way, we do business in such a way that we say, Look, we are not exploiting people. We are not asking them the tough questions. We are academics. We are good people. And we have academic integrity. We want to do a job. We want to understand um, how our society is evolving. We want to talk to them. But we are not going to violate their rights. So that's why you need to go through ethics approval. And, you know, in ethics approval, You'd think that, okay, I'm not going to inject them with uh, a syringe or I'm not going to hurt them or anything like that. So I, I, I should be able to, to ask them. I'll give you uh, an example. So we, I, I, I do one of these studies each, uh, every three or four years. I, 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 um, I do a qualitative uh, uh, research paper, and it's through one of my PhD. And at the moment, we're doing it on um, people who... Uh, who had losses from um, from cyclones, etc., in um, in South Africa, but the last one that I did was uh, people who were victim of bushfires. Okay, so for me, I know that we're not gonna uh, we're not gonna hurt them because it, we were just finance people, and you know uh, we by the time we started doing this and uh, doing the literature. And um, we talked to some people who do research in, uh, with victims, etc. They said to me, do you want to go in now and study them right after a bushfire? I said, no, I, just give, I need to give them some space, man. I'll just go in. He says, see, other people, other researchers will be in their face, right in the middle when they are suffering and going through a traumatic event. There are researchers with no conscience that will do that. That's why we have a fixed approval for you to know the boundaries of where to cross and what not to cross, etc. And then there's more to it uh, in ethics. See, uh, yeah, so see, the other question was, uh, which we didn't think about because we are finance people. And when we applied for ethics, ethics came back and say, you need to have a number to dial in case you have 
a breakdown. And I said, that for what? Um, I don't understand. He's like, Vic, this is a person who just experienced a traumatic event. And they, some of them may have lost a child, a parent, a brother, in a bushfire. Now, when you are interviewing them and you talk about your losses, do you think they can melt down and start crying? I said, yes. So are you going to hug them? I said, I don't know. Uh, but this is harassment, sexual harassment. If you hug somebody while working, um, they can come back and sue you. So I said, oh, my God, this is, this is crazy. Um, yeah. So now that you know it, do you think your PhD student will know about stuff like this? No. So then this is what we propose. You follow the ethics procedures, and this is what it's made up of, and you need to have this. And if something like this happens, uh, here's a phone number, like a counselor that you can call, and you can put them on the line and let somebody who, who can handle this sort of pressure help you out. So you see, um, it is not just a matter of filling up a, a questionnaire and then giving it to people and getting the data, analyzing it. There is more to it. And every paper that I've rejected in um, qualitative research is when they don't give you any indication that they have done an ethics approval. And if you, if you decide to go and collect your data, primary data, because it's, you don't have to pay for databases, et cetera, which I understand is, uh, is something that we will do as researchers. We don't like to pay. We don't have the money. We'll find cheap sources. But remember, you have to do the hard work. Otherwise, everything that you've done, when it comes down to um, good journals, they will need to see the evidence that you understand um, ethics approval, et cetera. So now, the next thing that you need to know is uh, we need to do a pilot testing. So once I've designed my questionnaire, I will pilot test it with people in the department, with uh, practitioners. Initially, I started with 40 questions. And they all complain it's too long, et cetera. So I redefine all my questionnaires, and I, I brought it down to about 29, which is about 30 to 40 minutes. Okay. Now, 30 to question, uh, questionnaire is a lot. Okay. So I have uh, my next door neighbor, and he is a, the director of marketing for uh, for Apple in the Middle East. And when I did my survey on COVID-19 and I posted it on uh, LinkedIn, he went in and went to do the survey. And then he walked into my house later that night and said, you are unbelievable. You, I need to teach you how to do a survey. And I said, okay, tell me what's wrong. I gave up after 10 minutes and blah, 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 blah. You're not gonna get one response. You're not going to get 20. You're not going to be, nothing is going to come out of this. Then I explained to him, no, I am not a marketing guy. I'm a finance guy. And I deal with people who care, who will have time. And that's why I do a comprehensive survey. And I'm working, all my thing work, we work with people who care about what we're doing. Right? So these victims, they would spend the time telling you how they are bleeding. Our corporate treasurers, they'll tell you, uh, uh, what the problem they are facing, even though they have time, they will find that even though they don't have time, they do find the time for us because they know we are doing something good for our community. That's where the response rate came out. Okay. So in the end, I had 40, 459 responses for COVID-19 and I showed him, he says, Vic, you're right. I am a marketing guy. I send this marketing thing and it's different and people don't care. They just respond. I said, yeah, sometimes they please you. They just click, click, click. They don't even read. Um, and you go and analyze data like this. Me, my kind of survey? No, it's serious. And if you don't send it back to me, I have no trouble because I know you don't have time. And I don't want to deal with uh, uh, people who never put a thought into it. So we designed a different kind of survey. Now, the next thing that you need to be worried is when you get, and people who are experts in quantity surveys, 
And the discipline that does it most is marketing. So for them, when you go and you say, ah, I've got a response rate of 12% or 9%, they said strict rejection. And I say to them, why would you reject? Like we're talking about conferences that I attended and seminars that I presented where you had uh, marketing people. They said to me, are you kidding me? You put 100 people in a room, you give each and every one a survey questionnaire, and only 12% decide to participate, the remaining decides to go. And I said, dude, this is not what we do. We don't even meet them. We send it through whatever um, um, information we get from the exchange. We get their addresses. We get their uh, names and their ranking, and we send it to them. And then out of nowhere, they come back. So if 120 has responded, for me, well, think about it. It's your statistics, right? If you have 12 observations, it's, it's the statistics. If you have 30, it's normal distribution. And we are happy after 160. So for me, any survey that I do, it's going to be about 160. So I'm quite happy with it. So I shut down these professors in marketing very quickly because I tell them, look, you don't understand the kind of work that we do. And, and I've published um, with this, with only nine. And you have to be able to explain why. Because a guy who earns one million is not going to give you 45 to an hour of time. And if only a portion that care does it, it's good. It's valuable information that we're getting, and we need to talk about it. Now, we, that's okay. So, so now, let's talk about, say, um, the email version of whether it's going to work. And we hear a lot about um, using online platforms, LinkedIn, etc. Do they actually work? Um, so. When we, we did ours, we targeted 700, uh, 1,784 firms in, uh, listed on the stock exchange. And the FDA had 237 members. So all of them, uh, we mailed to everybody that we could. In terms of um, responses, we got 107 by mail. So what this tells us is people like to, especially uh, they are old uh, corporate treasurers. They don't like uh, online on their phone. They don't even know how, sometimes how to use their phone and, and all these links and uh, all the technical technology that we have. So they actually like to have a piece of paper. So then when they travel on the train or anywhere else on the plane, they just take it, print it, take it with them, fill it, and then by the time they get back to the office, give it to their secretary and they mail it back to us. So mail responses has been uh, quite high. And online was not so not so cool. Okay? So that's why I say I had a response of 8.9, 8.5. And everybody was quite, um, particularly uh, the marketing people, they were quite um, um, uh, surprised that even you get a, a, a good price for, uh, uh, in London for it in, in finance. So what I'll say is you need to be able to justify what's happening and what's going on with yours. Okay. Now, um, okay, next move on. The results were, were, were quite good in the sense that we found a number of things um, uh, in terms of uh, we showed a number of characteristics, like if you're in cash management, uh, what is it that are important? Okay. And um, you see here, uh, in, in this case, security costs came in because these guys were talking about Oh, it was just after 911, and we had this uh, uh, bill that came in in terms of putting security cost equipment inside inside the building, and I needed to find X million dollars, and I didn't have the money. So you put it here and see if everybody had the same thing. Nothing. Okay? And it was during the GFC, you get interest rate becoming a major factor. So we asked them how you predict your inventory. They told us uh, forecasting. Uh, just forecasting sales, the old, good old-fashioned way. And at the time, everybody was talking in the industry about ERP system. Oh, and guess on. what? It was not a major issue. So the results, like I said, I'm not going to go through the results because uh, you're not here to, to learn about the results. So in the end, what we said was um, if you want to profile a working capital manager, a corporate treasurer, if you are 
overconfident. Um, you rely on inventory models for your forecasting. If you have loss aversion bias, you reduce your bad debt. Uh, if you have representativeness bias, you manage firms uh, under distress. And if you have self serving bias, you become a good manager. So, what was the implication of this now? You see, when you go for a job interview, what you don't realize is you have to fill up a questionnaire. And in these questionnaires, they are usually designed by a guy like me who helps the recruiter, uh, sorry, uh, the employer, to understand whether we need you on board or not. So, a typical thing that uh, a number of young people do is uh, uh, we ask the question. Do you, do you, have you done any uh, extreme sports? And please name it, bondy jumping or the equivalent. And so many of them want to tell you more about their bondy jumping. And the minute they click yes, we don't even invite them. Why? Because you're telling me you are a risk taker. And in finance, we know that risk aversion is what we need to cultivate, but not risk taking behavior. So why would I bring somebody that will go and take my money and gamble when he's supposed to be taking care of my money? So you see, uh, these uh, psychological questions that are out there, and you need to be careful when you fill up um, these questionnaires. Now, when you come to my classroom in behavioral finance, I teach you how to beat each and every one of these questions. But at the same time, as I teach you this, in my next consultancy, I will have to change my questions so that I can catch you again in a different way. So there's a lot of uh, things going on with, with, with this area. So I might just uh, stop here on this topic and ask you if you have any questions with regards to this technique before I move on to the other one. Okay, this is a behavioral finance question. So the way you design it, you have to make sure that uh, the respondent doesn't know they are going through a, a behavioral finance question. So here we are capturing a bias that I haven't talked about, it's, which is called hindsight bias. And hindsight bias is, uh, you know, the people who always think the world will end. So they say, I know something will happen. I told you this will happen. So this is called hindsight bias. So here we go. So the catchphrase that these people use, I knew this will happen one day, something like that. So if somebody clicks in on this multiple times when we ask them, we know that they have what we call a uh, hindsight bias. And hindsight bias with uh, hypothesis. Uh, child of a... Yeah? Yeah, it's unsure go to question number three. What does it mean, sir? Question number three? Yeah, I mean, if the answer is unsure, go to question three. I, I know this will happen one day, the last option. Okay. Unsure, go to question number, question three. Okay, so okay, so yes, go to question three because if they they uh, if they are not sure, they don't have to answer this. That means they don't have a bias. And then if they have a bias, I want to know what were you thinking about? Yeah. So okay, pretty much, yeah. So if you yeah. if you were to have if you were to have this bias, uh, the hindsight bias, you think the world will come to an end. What would you do? You buy insurance policies. You will have all the precautions taken. You will save food in your um, uh, in in your house, hoping that one day when the world will end, you will have food. You will have money. You have water. You have all this. So if you put all these into uh, into practice, then you're very well prepared, and you will recover quicker. In this particular case, in the case of COVID-19, people who always thought the world will end. Um, they say, look, it's happening, it's happening. So I'm so happy that I bought insurance, I bought this, I bought that, I've got gold, I've got all this. Now, um, I wanted to figure out what else do they do, and that's why I asked this. But if you, if you don't um, have this bias, I want you to move on and save time, you know, don't read it. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue, and I'll show you. Usually, uh, my behavioral biases are hidden uh, under uh, uh, investments. Okay. So here you got insurance, you got all that. Now here. Let's start with this. Remember um, uh, this, the fourth bias, which is, uh, what was it? Um, Self-serving bias. 
Okay, so I give them a question. Your uh, investments are decreasing in value. To what extent do you think it's the following factors? So a person with um, um, uh, self-serving bias will blame the Australian economy. Okay, and then somehow I will have another uh, question here. When your investment is doing very well, how come? Uh, what 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 would be the reason? They will say their vision. Okay, so if I combine these two together, I've caught this person with um, self-serving bias. I've set two conditions. Okay, so they need to meet both of them to be able to 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 do that. As you can see, this question they won't even know. They think they are in the, uh, answering questions about investments when in fact. I'm capturing it. This whole section, I don't have anything to, to, to publish about because I've just camouflaged my questions. Now, let's look at, say, um, um, uh, the question on overconfidence, okay? So, clearly it was 2016 when I asked them to make a prediction. So I tell them, you are in this time, uh, September, October time, the cash rate was 1%. What do you think uh, it will be by December? Okay, so if they say um, it will increase, okay, then I ask them how confident. Okay, I give them a second question. I'll explain to you the second question. So here is up, dec decrease, increase, decrease, or stay the same. And then the second one is, do you think it will be into specific region, uh, specific range? And I'll tell you the difference in a minute. So let's take to 7.2. So I ask them, how confident are you? So they say increase. Uh, no, I didn't ask them. I asked them to predict. That, that means I've asked them to predict something. And they predict it. They say increase. Now, I say, how confident are you in question 7.2? They say very confident. So I don't know the answer either. So I've asked them to predict something. I don't know the answer. They don't know the answer. If he clicked increase and the actual outcome was decrease and he said he was very confident, I will classify him as overconfident. Okay? So now, if he then later on, he gave me a very more, a more precise amount where it should be and he's definitely wrong and I will say, uh, you've got a problem, mate. You're very overconfident. So... Um, that's how we play all these questions. So we give you your if you your investment increased by ten percent, twenty percent, more than thirty percent, you can relate to this, right? In terms of your loss, uh, your representativeness bias, you see it going up by ten, going up by twenty, etc. Getting getting to see trends. So please um, download my paper if you if you are interested. Download my paper because each and every one of my papers. Um, I've got um, something on it, yeah? Now, let me continue. Do we have any questions? Sorry, I had a second question, and I stopped you. Please tell me what the questions were. So my question was, ki the questionnaire that you are using, hello, am I audible? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. So my, my question is, ki the questionnaire that you have used, it is an adopted scale, or the, the questionnaire was made by you? Because we use mostly the adopted scale, and which which is in the range of Likert. We use Likert scale for doing the research kind of a thing. Because the, the, the questionnaire that you are showing it out, so uh, can you tell us the sources from where we can get this questionnaire? Look, if you just download my paper, you'll get the questionnaire. Uh, every paper that I've published has got uh, the questionnaire in the appendix. Okay. okay. So my, now... With, yeah. with regards to your question, uh, where do I get the questionnaire? Uh, Vikram, I build it from scratch. Okay. The first one, I build yes, it sir. from scratch. And then yeah. later on, I pass the same questionnaire to my next PhD student. I say, hey, the reason okay. why I'm giving you this and modify it is so that you don't miss out on anything. And it, it is prompting you to think about uh, whether the literature talks about this in there. Yes, and then from there, we, we, I ask them to check what is the literature saying. Okay. So, but mostly we use an adopted scale. 
Yeah, I used mostly Likert. adopted skin. Yeah, uh, Likert skin, and then we do a confirmatory factor analysis, and then we we move to the structural model. We do. I do. Like, I do like that only. But the questionnaire I have just saw saw it was not in Likert, but it was something different that I have sought for the first time. So, but for going from the scratch, it is a very lengthy process that we have to go it out. because making a questionnaire is a different ma- making a questionnaire from starting will be a different thing sir so i need your suggestion for how to go about that so uh if i share this one this file i will show you it is on this likert scale uh yeah i'll show you so you see i have i'm asking you a question and then you get these are my likert scale 1 2 3 4 5 yeah so yeah, yeah. here is yeah So uh, these are my Likert scale. So I've got it. It's the same thing. Okay. Okay, sir. And sir, can we use the uh, concept of mediation and moderation in behavioral finance? Mediation and moderation. Yeah. What do, What do you mean by mediation and moderation? Because I have a lot sir, number of things that is coming to my head. Can you be be more specific? So um, a concept of, for example, there is a structural model, and I can use. financial literacy as a mediation for the biases in india for an investment so decision that, i'm with you i'm with you now okay so yeah. mind you um mind you i have never done any structural modeling with mine thus far the reason okay. is very simple i okay. do not have enough observations to do exactly. a proper uh, regression analysis because my target was always high profile individuals financial advisors and uh, victims of bushfire i don't have like thousands of 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 um of observations so then by the time i reach uh, the the quantity side of doing any kind of modeling so what i find is i have so many variables with uh, with uh, so many variables and not enough observation it makes no sense to 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 do it so i don't go beyond i just use some discrete statistics to publish it now um we've a current work that we've done on covid-19 i have 459 and we are running some regressions we haven't gone into structural modeling uh, as yet we've done a paper which is under review and just before coming i saw the email saying what are these guys doing we're supposed to tell us they're going to give us an acceptance uh, uh, in in february it's march we haven't heard from them and etc So, okay. in terms of um, doing proxies, personally, mm-hmm. I don't have a problem. Right, but then mm-hmm. when you merge, say your data that you've collected, and then weave other kind of data that is available, it becomes quite messy. And I, I would not know. It will raise more problems than uh, than solutions. So try to keep them separate, if I may give you the advice. Okay, sir. Got it. Thanks a lot, sir. Okay. So, if we don't have uh, any question, can I just take a five minutes break and then I come back? We continue. Ah, uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah. Thank you for your patience. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, we can hear. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for your patience. I've been talking four hours before I came, so you know it's uh, coming to the point where I've got a, a dry throat. I needed a glass of water. Just breathe a little. So thank you for your patience. I'm back to normal now. Okay. So now let's move on on to other kind of uh, behavioral sort of research that we do. And this is something um, that I started in my PhD. and then later on um it was adopted around the world and there's a lot of things happening in behavioral finance and it's created a new generation of um of research called uh, quantitative behavioral finance so these guys unlike me where i've used um in the previous one use quantitative research these guys are using uh indices but behavioral indices sentiment index So let me start with um, with this, and as you can see, I've got many A publications from there. I've got one A, two A, three uh, A, and um, there's, there's probably more, and I haven't listed it here. 
So people are loving this, and it is currently under debate, and there's a lot of um, um, a lot of um, Europeans who are interested uh, in this kind of research. So let's let's get into this. So this um, again, uh, how did I start with this? Um, I'll rewind back 1999 um, when I finished my master's in finance and I was a good student. I, I got mostly high distinctions and when I fail, I get a distinction in courses like uh, law or something like that. Um, and I believe the efficient market hypothesis, but I also like to invest money. So after my master's, I went to investment seminars and I saw investors and they're telling me they're making money by reading newspapers articles, by uh, reading investment magazines. And I'm going, how is that possible? Announcements were made on the exchange and they are make, making money later on. This doesn't sound about right to me. They, I went back to my professor and I said, Sinclair, you know, you lied to me. He says, I did? I said, yeah. You told me that you can't make money and everything that you taught. He says, yeah, it's called the efficient market hypothesis. And I said, it's rubbish. It doesn't hold. How come these guys are making it? And when, when we come to school, you don't teach us about these people making money. He tells us that how they can't make money. And I said, um, he said to me, Vic, I know you have um, an intention to do a PhD. And if you're right, why don't you prove it? Because it's very difficult to prove. I said, OK, here I am. Um, uh, got my scholarship um, ready to start my PhD proving them wrong. And I did. And when we engage in that, um, I, I started looking at um, noise traders and who are these people and what do they do, etc. So noise trading was uh, my gig. Now I had to prove it. Okay. So who are noise traders? Let me jump and explain who these guys are. So they are your small small investors, mom and dad investors. They don't know anything, but they invest later. They still make money. They still have stories to tell you how much money they've made. Now, professionals, sometimes you, you think like um, you work for an investment bank and you act almost instantly. No, you still have delayed reaction. So that makes you, when you're not trading, when there's information, that makes you noise trader. And how, how so? If you are a trader and you don't have a gut to put a buy order, and then you see one other person who is a winner, and you know he's a good guy, he wins, you think, okay, I follow him. He buy, I buy, he sell, I sell. That's called herding behavior. So I'm thinking, okay, professionals do that too. Then you have wealthy individuals that will just go with the flow. There's smart money. There's a whole bunch of them. And as they do exist, it creates a problem. It's called, well, you make money. You make money out of trading, out of following other people. But is it actual uh, risk that you, you, you take on market risk? I don't think it is market risk. And I'm arguing this is noise traders risk. Okay? So it is not market risk, it is noise traders risk. This is um, my new gig that I was coming. So first I needed to look at the literature. So the literature, when I started, there's not many people writing about this. So Black, we all know Black. Um, so Black 1995 published a paper in the Journal of Finance and he mentioned noise traders as a possibility. Man, that opened up a window. I zoom in on this and I just went over kill. Okay, this is not new. I'm not the first one who's saying it. Give me a chance, people. Now I need to explore it. So that's how I got my window open and I started moving. Then if you were reading, like, seriously, the 1998 paper, uh, I started my PhD in 2000. So 998 paper was not even published. It was like uh, uh, their working paper and I was reading it and I thought, my God, this is good. They're talking about information traders being the rational ones, but they're also talking about people making mistakes and they are overreacting and underreacting. It was music to my ears doing this literature review. And very quick, within a period of nine months in my literature review, my supervisor said to me, Vic, I've got good news. I said, what is it? There's a bunch of people who are crazy like you to think that it exists. And I said, yeah. He said, look, there's all these Americans. They call themselves behavioral finance scientists. I said, oh, 
then I'm not alone. I better join them. And that's when I read about these other articles. So it took me um, a long time uh, to publish a paper, and it got published in the Journal of, um, of, uh, of uh, Behavioral Finance with no revision, none. That was my first publication, by the way. And, um, and from there, I, I always talked about it. Whenever I, I was teaching, I was working for RMIT. We have campuses in Asia. And whenever I go to Hong Kong and I teach about traditional finance, and they'll look at me and say, Professor, I don't think you know what you're talking about. We are Chinese. We don't know mathematics. We bet on anything that moves. You put two cockroaches here, you place a bet, I will bet against it. There's no mathematics. There's no KPM. There's nothing that would uh, really capture my behavior. Would you not say so? I said, yes. I said, well, hear about my, my paper then. And I tell them about this paper, we love it. They said, yeah, that makes better sense. So in, in terms of noise traders, uh, if you look at uh, the literature, you'll find there has been several attempts in, in 1990. Uh, 1965, Friedman talked about it. Um, the SSW 1990 came up with a model. Uh, Brown as well. Um, there has been few, but the problem with these models were you can't really apply them. And um, the professor I was talking yesterday said, you know, in my time when I was studying, people were looking at closed-end funds, and this is how we did our our uh, our work back then. Well, that was a, the DSSW was a product of that. And like the professor mentioned yesterday, uh, it was very restricted, and we needed to find new ways of, of, of moving forward in our life. And that's what I did. So... I'm showing you the literature here. On the right-hand side, there's a lot of people who made an attempt to, to, to try to do it. And I personally don't like their model because I find them very restrictive. You can't, you can't put it on any stock to see where the noise traders are, which stock is better. And then my paper was, uh, that's a Ramia 27. And then um, I had a PhD student from China who said to me, Professor, we read your paper and we think um, it, it makes perfect sense. And can I do uh, a PhD on your supervision so you can guide me and proving the same thing uh, in, in, in China? And I said, yes, by all means, I'll be very flattered. So took her on board and the paper that I'm presenting today is, is her paper that we published. We got two A's or something from her, from her paper, uh, from her study. So as we're doing this literature, on this uh, left-hand side, Lietal, Verma and Verma, etc. These are the guys that are using sentiment index. Now, let me pause a minute and talk about the sentiment index. So, uh, market sentiment. You know, if you look at your um, KPM, it assumes that you take your uh, return from a market from ASX 500, from S&P 500, which is what we use as a proxy for uh, the market portfolio. Lovely. But that assumes that all the traders are informed. But what if I was to assume that no, there is no, um, um, there is no, uh, there is irrational, we are making decisions based on our emotion and our sentiment, then we have to replace this with a sentiment index. Now, it is not me who said this. It's uh, Sheffin and Statman publish a paper and talk about uh, um, using sentiment index, and instead of um, talking about, say, uh, the KPM, which is capital asset pricing model, they introduce the behavioral asset pricing model. Now, they explain a number of things, and I did a variation of this. And I use uh, a sentiment index, and at the time there was none. So I relied on the literature like uh, Varian and Kyle in 1982s, 80s, 90s around, um, say, volume traded, because if you have a, uh, a difference in opinion and if you're noise traders or not, all of you would trade and that trade volume will capture uh, all the market participants, including, um, including the noise traders. Now, there is another guy who came up and said, okay, volume traded is in general, but what if you were to find the excessive trading? And he called it the excessive bullishness index. 
So you do an average. What is an average uh, trading volume? And if you are uh, bullish, you trade more than this. Then anything that we capture above this part, and he made uh, a story around excessive bullishness index. I tried um, uh, something called uh, a dynamic volume index at the time. Tried to publish it, got rejected, and the rejection came very quick to say, we don't like it, and don't even think about our journal in the future. And the journal was accounting and finance. This was the start of uh, uh, the rejection that I had from mainstream, because mainstream didn't like the idea of behavioral finance and sentiment index. And they, they, of course, they give you a reason. And the reason that the game is, um, you know, you are proposing an index that has not been tested by the market. How can we be sure whatever you're saying is right? And you are just weak, a PhD student. Um, I said, OK. So I needed to find uh, a, a, a sentiment index. And while I was looking, uh, and then came um, Australian um, a bank in Australia, CBA, one of the big four banks. They, they advertise a product for small investors. And they say, look, small investors, we created a portfolio for you of stocks that you can invest in. And this portfolio consists of the top 10 most preferred stocks in Australia. We Australians, we like this stock. We will, let them, we will never let them go down. So I thought, OK, here's um, uh, the, the sentiment index, the Australian sentiment index. So I replicated that uh, index and created, uh, replicated that portfolio, develop an index, and I call it the mom and dad index. This is what I used back then. So when my PhD student came in and we started talking about the sentiment index, she said to me, Vic, we have the dragon index in there. So I said, okay. So now if you look at all the uh, people around the world, even Bloomberg and Reuters now has a sentiment index for you to use. Now, if I rewind back telling you about these guys, the European uh, people doing research on be uh, quantitative behavioral finance research, they are building these, um, these indices and they're coming up with amazing technology to do it. So um, this was them. And what you don't know, and I'm doing a lot of consultancy and we are applying for grants as well on the basis of, you know, social media. Social media is throwing so much misinformation. We call it fake news, right? And the stock market is reacting to fake news on social media, etc. So this noise trading activity, it's become it's it's getting into asset prices. And we need to find ways to 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 develop other indices on social media to bring this on our platform to talk about. And guess what? People are doing it as research in behavioral finance. And that is a future and that is a trend. I didn't see myself starting this up uh, in um, my PhD when I, when I started, but now it's becoming um, quite popular. If you like some equations, I can throw some at you. And equation one is just your basic KPM. And note, I've uh, denoted uh, with a superscript of C for uh, beta KPM and beta BAPM. And the BAPM, you can see RM for equation two is coming from my sentiment index. So then I can expect a difference between these two. That gives me what I call the behavioral error. Now, why would the behavioral error move? Uh, it could be because of information arriving. It could be because of portfolio rebalancing, liquidity traders, macroeconomic factors. And of course, there is noise traders. So if I take um, um, the behavioral error, I process it by controlling for all these factors, what will be left will be noise traders risk. So we develop this model by talking about, okay, change in behavioral error. We run it on any time information arrives. And IE is a dummy variable, one, for when information arrives, zero when it doesn't. And then I run it. So alpha is representing uh, noise traders. Beta is representing information traders. And now I can stop playing with them. So if there is no information on the day, no information arrived, so IE is zero, zero multiplied by beta, I have only alpha. So that gives me this equation here. 
according to EMH, if alpha is zero, we have a very efficient market and alpha should be zero. If alpha is not zero, you can have a positive or a negative reaction, right? We sort of name them. And these two instances would be where you have, uh, uh, where you have uh, noise traders. Now, let me get into this one. And let me introduce you to the model that shows you how um, uh, the interaction between noise traders and information traders. If you have the view of what I have, that the market is not efficient, that means we have an alpha. That means we have noise traders. And if I have noise traders, we want information traders to oppose them. And in that way, it could decrease my alpha. So alpha plus beta, where beta is a negative, I'll have a residue of mu. That is if I oppose uh, my noise traders. But in a bull market where noise traders has got more power, there's more people joining in, in trading on noise, what will happen is even information traders would, um, uh, would um, join noise traders and they will become uh, noise traders themselves. So that could lead to a higher level of noise in the market. Now, I can start um, making my proposition. So my proposition one is for EMH to hold, now that model that I showed you is called information adjusted noise model. So if alpha goes up and you clear it, there's no mu, we have efficient market hypothesis. If mu is not equal to zero, my hypothesis is I'm gonna get instances of underreaction, overreaction, and information pricing error. So now let's look at an underreaction. From my point of view, what is an underreaction that the market does? So there is an error, that means we have noise traders, and information traders knows it, they oppose them. And as they oppose them, they don't kill them, they don't neutralize them, they leave a residue of mu. So for me, this is on a positive, I call it positive underreaction. In a similar manner, things can be on the negative side. And as you see noise traders going in the other direction, you oppose them. Uh, remember, uh, that could be seen as a, both can be seen as a contrarian investment strategy. And they leave a, an error of mu in the market and being negative, I call it negative underreaction. The next instance is where um, even information traders can make mistake. And if you have an error and they oppose noise traders, they overshoot their prediction and they themselves leave an error. So that is an overreaction. And it is, in this case, uh, a particular uh, overreaction. And you can flip it on the downside uh, to get uh, the different um, uh, results. So then if you have an error, and noise traders knows, okay, I give up, uh, it's Bitcoin, I, ca I can't fight Bitcoin, Bitcoin keep increasing, I need it to, um, I need it to, uh, to be in my portfolio for diversification purposes, I'll buy them. So here we go, uh, information traders making uh, a mistake of themselves and joining uh, noise traders. And this one, when it happens, I call it positive information pricing error. So here we are, we've got a set of conditions that we can apply. And then if we get these, if these conditions are met, we do have ourselves uh, overreaction, underreaction, and uh, overpricing error. Of course, I try to look if uh, you can make money out of it. And I run these regressions to see if these errors are related to returns. So here's a graph of if you calculate your CAPM, you get your beta for over 100 companies that we took. The betas of these 100 companies are really higher and the BAPM is lower. Why is that? Because the BAPM um, tells you to recognize noise traders' risk. And if you are smart enough to say they exist and they are, there is noise traders' risk, then you've actually reduced your risk. So that's why a BAPM uh, shows you a lower risk. Now let's look at the results. We, we assessed 28 thousand information arrival in China, okay, of which 5,200 is underreaction, meaning I have about 18% of underreaction. In terms of IPE, 
which is information pricing error, I have 40%. Overreaction, I have 40%. So if you take 40 plus 40 plus 18, it gives you, in China, 99% of the time the market is not efficient. And I publish this with brilliant colors, and Chinese people love it because they say, yes, now we've got a paper that tells us exactly what we believe. So this is some uh, mathematical model that we developed um, to, to, uh, uh, to come up with noise trading behavior.